Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I think most of us will be joining either late in the afternoon or very early in the morning. But thank you so much for joining Rocket Healthcare for this webinar. This is one episode of a webinar series that we will be showcasing over the next, um, yeah, over the next few months of one episode of a webinar series that is designed to address one tissue or one application of bioprinting at a time. And each episode will be done twice in a row to accommodate several time zones. And so just want to announce when you come in, uh, please mute yourselves. And if you not have signed up in advance through our registration link and you just came in through the meeting ID, at the end of the webinar, please remember to leave me personally your name and email, and then I'll be able to send you a copy of the presentation. All right, so before further ado, let's begin. So the topic of today's webinar is the bioprinting of the human skin. And the idea that I'd like to bring home throughout this presentation may be summarized in two words, the human skin and on demand. So first, let's take a look at this one minute clip that we've prepared at Rocket Healthcare. A car rented, a meal ordered, a flight booked, a job applied, all at the swipe of a finger. A new era of on-demand economy can be now applied even in your laboratories. As a pioneer, Rocket Healthcare will take the first step to provide on-demand services to the scientists and researchers, reducing both time and cost of their experiments. Introducing Apotem Kit, all-in-one solution for the human skin on-demand. Made with Rocket Healthcare's high-precision technology of 4D biofabrication, Apotem Kit gives you a full control of time, design, and quality of your research. Your time is precious be independent from supplier's time block. Use any cell sources, depending on your experiment needs. Benefit from repeatability with their validated protocol and the comfort of your bench. The world's first bioprinter to regenerate human skin is now empowering your skin research. So with that video, I would like to just summarize what Rocket Healthcare, um, where I am speaking from, is about. And Rocket Healthcare is a company that specializes in using the bioprinting technology to create breakthrough methods for organ regeneration and tissue engineering. We work on various projects with the vision of saving lives and enhancing the quality of life. But our vision with bioprinting is also attentive to the fact that bioprinting as a manufacturing process gives the power to create to the researcher's own hand. So why not work to create a system and an ecosystem that promotes researchers to make better human tissue models on their own? So the one project I'd like to share about today is the development of the human skin equivalent, also known as HSE, with bioprinting. What is the purpose of it? What does it take to create? What is it as what is its applications today? And in the context of all of these, what can Rocket Healthcare offer to support? So first and foremost, what is driving the need and use of the human skin equivalent today? And I'm not sure, I'm sure that this is not a completely unfamiliar subject as these are some of the several mega trends that we see in biomedicine today, giving us reasons to innovate really in this area. First and foremost is the global trend of animal testing and in cosmetic and pharmaceutical industries. With the relentless advancement of medical technology, um, there has been the sacrifice of countless animals in science, which we all know, and the struggle between animal rights groups and researchers has lasted already over 30 years. But as an important outcome of the struggle, the world has seen a ban on animal testing on cosmetics since 2004. 13, starting with Europe. And in Korea, where I am in today, the ban occurred in 2017. 
And the key thing here is that researchers are now trying to turn to alternative methods for animals. And amidst this wave of change, the HSE is in the spotlight as a humane and more effective way to replace animals in the testing of new drug or cosmetic development. Second is the need for better human physiology and disease models, which has come naturally with the understanding that animal models and 2D skin models simply do not recapitulate what actually happens in the human body. And many studies have been done that, for example, demonstrated that chemicals which are non-irritants in the rabbit end up being irritants in the human skin. Studies, especially in cancer, have shown that 2D cell cultures are more resistant to a therapy than 3D cell cultures, basically leading to skewed possible decision makings in the evaluation of a novel therapy. And that leads us directly to the third reason that has been driving the need for human skin equivalents, and that is the need to save time and cost of R&D. Annually, the costs are about $2 billion to bring a new drug to the market, and this number has only doubled from the $1 billion it cost in 2010, according to uh, research from Deloitte Consulting. And so while the R&D costs are going up each year, ironically, the healthcare budget of each country is becoming more strained each year. And the only way to resolve this cost dilemma would be to create a fully human cell based testing method so we don't have to go through as much animal and failed clinical trial as we may have done before. Now, the United States, which is known to be the biggest market for cosmetics and pharmaceutical industries, has yet to ban animal testing, but it is undoubtedly moving toward it. And on September 10th, 2019, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency basically announced a milestone directive, and that was that the U.S. will prioritize efforts to reduce and eliminate animal testing across the U.S., by 2035. And step by step, the country says it will seek to do three things, which are to reduce the request for and funding of funding of mammal studies by 2030, 2025, and to eliminate all mammal studies by 2035, and even to exclude any reliance on animal studies by third parties from its approval process after the January 1st of 2035. And as you can see, the need for human skin equivalents is a real need. And one concept you may benefit from knowing is the principle of the three R's. And this was developed over 50 years ago, providing a framework for performing more humane animal research. And since then, it really has been embedded in national and international legislation and regulations on the use of animals in scientific procedures. And all of this, the background I have set so far, basically underpins the fact that ethical testing and the drive to develop human, test, human tissue testing methods is no longer a lifestyle choice. Rather, it is soon to become a legal requirement in the processing and manufacturing of new products because after all, 3R makes models that are more sustainable, more biologically efficacious, and at the end, more cost-effective to the biomedical ecosystems of today. Now let's talk about the human skin equivalent. What is it? It is basically an engineered tissue that is designed to structurally and functionally mimic the real human skin. As you can see in the diagrams and the HNEs, Above, an HNE begins foremost with the structural simulation of the stratification from the dermis to the epidermis, um, thinking that the function follows form. And the history of the HSE development actually goes way back to the 1940s, which is before the timeline that is uh, posted up here which is when the culturing of 3D human skin biopsies ex vivo began, just prior to the standardization of nutrient media. But soon after, in the 1950s and 60s, the development of mixed and single type primary 2D cell cultures, including that of human keratinocytes, prevailed as standard lab practice over organ culture 
and 3D cell culture. So although 2D culture of this type was simple and reproducible, the relevance for 3D constructs became more and more evident in the late 1970s as a living skin equivalent um, that basically implemented a dermis-like structure within collagen hydrogel. But further technical advances in the 80s and 90s, specifically the technology of electrospinning, led to the use of scaffolds. And moreover, at present, the implementation of 3D printing for use in biological applications is proposing new ideas to replace the hand poured hydrogel matrix or uh, fine meshes created by polymer solutions, setting a new standard for the production of architecturally more complex 3D tissue constructs. But besides the scientific push, there has also been a regulatory push. In the early 2000s, we have seen the rise of industry coalitions and national and international uh, agencies pushing forward to make animal alternatives the mission. And examples are the global OECD, the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing of the US, the USAT and NC3RS of Europe. All these centers have been basically creating communities of researchers and regulatory scientists committed to publicizing and standardizing human tissues as animal alternatives. And the key thing to note is the OECD guidelines for the testing of chemicals, which basically have provided a portfolio uh, standard ways to assess the efficacy of novel in vitro models for the potential effects of chemicals and human health and the environment. Now, to understand how to engineer a human tissue, we must first understand how it is structured. The human skin, um, for those of us who are uh, not too familiar with the structure itself, human skin is the largest organ in the body and it is an anatomical barrier between the internal and external environments. It protects the body from outside substances but it is also involved in internal physiological functions such as fluid homeostasis, thermoregulation, and immune surveillance to self-healing. So the skin is composed of various macro layers, as you can see in the picture, picture in front of you. But of those, the two are main layers, which are the epidermis and the dermis. Beneath the dermis lies the hypodermis, which is composed mainly of loose connective and fatty tissues, directly leading to the muscle and the bone layers. Human skin not only serves as a barrier, but it also provides an avenue for the transport of functional active drugs and reagents, and that is why it is a the human skin equivalent attracts main attentions from the cosmetic and pharma as well. Now, each macro layer of the human skin is further composed of sublayers. The major cells of the epidermis are keratinocytes, um, which comprise about 90 to 95%. And basically, the epidermis gets created as these cells proliferate and differentiate, starting from the deepest layer of the epidermis, called the stratum basilate. And as the basal keratinocytes proliferate, the daughter cells migrate and form the spinosum. And up and up, granulosum, lucidum, and all the way to corneum, which is a layer that provides the most significant contribution to the permeation barrier properties. But the rest five to 10% of the cells comprising the epidermis include immune cells and sensory cells and etc. Langerhans, for example, are dendritic cells that contribute to the immunological response, while melanocytes, which contribute to skin pigmentation, also protect the skin from harmful UV radiation. And merkel ranvier cells are like oval receptor cells um, that are present in the bacilli sublayer, actually, and they contribute to sensory reception. The dermis, which is below the epidermis, um, is considered the core of the skin 
system and it contains blood and lymph vessels, nerves, and other structures such as hair follicles and sweat glands. And though, um, as you can see in the picture, though not as clearly defined as in the epidermis, the dermis also is made up of two um, sublayers called the papillary and the reticular layers. The papillary is made up mostly of fibroblasts, while the reticular is made up of connective tissues with fibers of collagen and elastin. And these cell types and the biomaterials that I just mentioned give us ideas of uh, what are the components when you were engineering a human tissue. But these fibers are the ones that give the skin its characteristic structure, tensile strength and elasticity, but it is also these fibers that also make the border between the two sublayers appear almost connected and indistinct. And finally, the hypodermis, also called the subcutaneous layer, is um, underlying the dermis and right above the bones and muscle, muscles and bones. And though it is not strictly a part of the skin, for for those who are interested in creating a human tissue, human skin equivalent that is for subcutaneous injection models, they're uh, often interested in recreating this layer as well. Um, it consists of well vascularized, loose, areolar connective tissues and adipose tissues, which functions as a mode of fat storage and provides insulation and cushioning for the integument. And so with that, the human skin structure has been um, something that people have tried to mimic through various methods. And the traditional testing of compounds on skin has depended on animal tests and 2D cell culture methods as we are um, already familiar with. However, various research studies over the years have demonstrated basically that the, there is a lack of these models to fully recapitulate what happens in the actual human skin. And the one traditional animal test for cosmetics has been the DRAES test, um, it's called the DRAES test for skin irritation, which was developed back in the 1940s. Um, you can imagine this is also the same sort of time period when the culturing of ex vivo human uh, biopsies also sort of began, as I mentioned before. But um, this the rabbit test was used to predict skin irritation, um, and especially the animal of choice was the albino rabbit due to its high sensitivity to irritating compounds. And they were relatively easy and in inexpensive in handling. However, many publications like the one shown in the left have demonstrated that animal models can lead to incorrect labeling of, of chemicals. For example, in Table 4 of the 16 tested chemicals classified as irritants in rabbits, only five were found to be actually irritants for, um, for humans based on the human skin tests and also for chemicals to which the rabbit test exhibited 100% sensitivity, it turns out only 55% of those non-irritants were wrongly labeled as irritants when tested with the human skin model. So you see the discrepancy there. And in the same way, a comparison of 2D cell models to 3D has shown that the culture of skin cells in 3D exhibit a greater survivability against the same cytotoxic agents. As you can see in the graphs on the right, to the same given dose of hydrogen peroxide or silver nitrate, 3D cultures were shown to be twice as more likely to survive as 2D. And in addition, the study also showed that cells in co-culture were better basically at surviving these stresses than in monoculture, which brings home the necessity for building increasingly more complex tissues rather than relying on just one cell type in a tissue model. Against the limitations of animal models and existing 2D, various 3D fabrication methods for human skin have been developed. And the most common ones have included the following. Freeze drying, solvent casting, electrospinning, 
decellularized uh, animal skin as a scaffold, and 3D spheroids. And perhaps uh, some of you are already using these methods in the labs. And freeze drying, for example, is a technique for scaffold preparation that is that was most commonly uh, propagated in the bone engineering department. And re it relies on the basically the liquid to gas phase processing in which the frozen water in polymer nanocomposites is directly converted. Oh, sorry about that. Not liquid to gas, but solid to gas. And then they are then removed, um, leaving the porous structures. Solvent casting and salt leaching, um, sort of the same idea, but it's the addition of salts to a polymer solution and hardening, followed by removing of the salts by submerging the structure in a solution that basically dissolves the salts away, leaving poor structures. Electrospinning is the creation of nanofiber mesh um, by applying high voltage electrostatic forces to, to polymer solutions. And the decellularized pig skin is the combination of human cells to decel pig skin to serve as ECM scaffold and creating a human um, sort of tissue or organ out of it. And you may be familiar with a technique like this that was used by Atala to create the um, to blad to create the bladder that was eventually transplanted into a human patient and um, still uh, still going on today. And finally, there are 3D cell culture spheroids, which are made by seeding and growth of microsized cellular aggregates. Um, while a lot of these three-dimensional fabrication methods are large steps forward from the existing models I talked about in the previous slide, they are not without challenges themselves. And foremost, um, they include difficulties in often controlling the cellular composition and positioning within the same construct. And for processes like solvent casting, um, there are various pre-processing methods that may have adverse effects on the final result. And some of these methods that rely on manual seeding of cells, for example, could result from data in could result in data inconsistency due to human error. And the decellularized animal skin may be decellularized, but there are still the limitations we could have from animal derived components instead of fully human based. And finally, spheroids um, have caused certain problems as necrotic cores, where basically the cellular structures within um, near the core would be absent of oxygen or nutrient delivery from the media. And if you see the, the picture on the right is from a publication uh, in Singapore where a, a human skin research group directly compared the 3D bioprinting approach with manual casting approach, uh, which was basically based on seeding uh, manually with hand in a kind of a container that made a cast for this mold. Um, basically, with the bioprinted one, you obtained a perfectly circular shape using the freeform approach um, that you can do with the printer and an even distribution of the substrates, but the manual casting approach led to a disfigured shape that the research group says ultimately resulted in an abnormal pigmentation in the center. Now, ultimately creating the ideal skin model needs to consider one most important idea that is at play and not only related to skin, but human tissues in general, and that is homeostasis, which refers to the idea that human tissue is constantly at work to maintain stability while adjusting to conditions that are optimal for survival. For this, there is a great interplay of cellular crosstalks and signaling with the ECM environment. And there are many papers shown on skin that removing one single cell type could have pronounced differences on the structure and function of the resulting skin tissue. And many skin diseases are actually results of 
um, some malfunction in the cell interplay, right? And removing cells from the human and ECM environments can also have um, similar effects. And in fact, most recently, research into engineering of human skin equivalents has focused on better understanding two components of the skin, which are the immune cells and the ECM molecules. And research has shown that ECM molecules themselves um, with the signaling pathways they present are potent regulators of immune cell function. And in skin disease conditions, any alterations in the structure or the composition of ECM provide immune cells with enough cues that affect their activation states. And several studies have shown that both enzymatically digested ECM components as well as intact ECM proteins, um, but considering that they are all together there, can modulate activation as well as chemotaxis of immune cells. And some have even shown in cancer that just having the ECM from, from actual normal human cells present there with cancer could make the cancer cells uh, basically go backward uh, and almost return to normal cells or at least lose their um, tumor behavior. And so presently so far, investigations of wound healing, for instance, in 3D skin models have been limited to seeing how the wound closes by fibroblasts and keratinocytes. But if we understand that a lot of chronic wounds, such as diabetic foot ulcers, rely heavily on the functions or lack thereof um, of resident and circulating immune cell types, then it would be important to consider those in the ideal human skin equivalent model. And furthermore, um, even bacteria. Um, and I think yesterday in our first session of this webinar um, with the identical content in a different time zone, someone asked about, um, has there been research um, looking at skin and bacteria and the human skin equivalent. And, um, and basically, yes, there has been the incorporation of dermal bacteria like uh, Staphylococcus aureus um, or Acinotobacter bamini, which are some of the most common ones found, both pathogenic and non-pathogenic in the skin. And people have incorporated those in uninjured 3D skin equivalents to create a wound infection model for therapeutic development, but also to understand skin homeostasis in general. Um, after all, dermal bacteria play a big part um, on our human skin functions as well. Now, uh, having said all of these, the great thing about bioprinting, the 3D bioprinting, is that it opens doors to some of the possibilities that we have yet to see in existing 3D models. And the thing is about greater architectural complexity in mimicry. And this is possible because I think at the, the core of this is that it combines the best of both worlds of computer science and bio, biology, which I, I perceive as basically data-driven and cell-driven. So the advantages of bioprinting may be summarized in triple A's. These are automation, which basically means that through it, it proceeds to replace manual and randomized seeding of cells to an automated and even seeding with the help basically of a robot. And you obtain the result of minimizing batch to batch variation and getting closer to the original design as offered by the computer. And that directly relates to architecture. With computer-aided motion, the bioprinter can potentially pattern cells into much more architecturally complex structures in terms of cell positioning and compartment, compartmentalization. And the most potent, perhaps, the biggest potent benefit of bioprinting may be the autologous, maybe the use of autologous materials in this platform technology. Ultimately, if the bioprinter were to go beyond the bench to life in the hospital, its ability to print in vivo autologous solutions directly from the patient into customized tissue for implants would be uh, a revolution for biomedicine. Now, for those of us who are new 
Um, this is a sample workflow of the bioprinting process. The pre-bioprinting stage consists of identifying a 3D model to print, and this, this blueprint can either come from CT MRI scans of the patient body or via manual um, designing of a 3D model. The researcher then selects the appropriate biomaterials like natural polymers or synthetic polymers, and they choose the cell types to build the tissue with. And the 3D model is sliced uh, concurrently into an instruction file that the printer can read. And once those biomaterials, which we often call bio ink, are loaded, the bio printing stage happens and it's basically putting into reality the 3D image into a palpable structure through various methods like layer by layer extrusion. And the post printing maturation process consists of cross linking the resulting bio inks to create a structurally stable form. And there could be various methods for cross-linking, or some might not have cross-linking at all, just using the hydrogel standalone. But the cross-linking methods could consist of temperature, UV light, or chemical cross-linking. And then you have the 3D bioprinted tissue product. Given the sample workflow mentioned before, this is what the human skin equivalent process might look like. And these are just taken from images taken directly in-house at the Rocket Healthcare uh, Skin R&D Center. And as you can see, the stratified layers of the human skin equivalent are ultimately realized onto well-played formats. And that is uh, something that allows the use of human tissue models for um, throughput assays like drug skinning or cosmetic product development, which are uh, and toxicological research, which are some of the most common uses of the human skin. But the applications of the HSE are, are really diverse. And I tried to pick out some, um, just a few snippets of applications that have been done using the HSE. And these applications could be divided largely into three categories. One is the in vitro efficacy test model for toxicological testing and evaluation of novel drugs or topical agents that have been developed. Second is in vitro models for skin physiology or disease modeling, just, just better understanding how the human skin behaves. And third is the in vivo model for potentially transplantation and skin regeneration. First, let's talk about the in vitro efficacy test applications. We see the left hand upper upper left corner um, corrosion and irritation test with the human skin equivalent. It's something that have already been established as OECD guidelines, um, which I mentioned a few slides before. And these guides, um, there are various ones, but the ones that we may note are titled TG meaning testing guidelines 431 and 439. These are basically guidelines that allow for standardized evaluations of in vitro methods um, to replace animal testing in the evaluation of compounds and chemicals. And basically a substance is applied to the surface of the HSE to check for toxicity within four hours. And I can show some data later on uh, in house now, absorption and penetration or permeability tests are also done. And these are done on HSE by measuring the amount of transdermal moisture loss um, or through immunostaining of moisture-related proteins after um, moisture has been placed on top of the HSE. The sensitization test is something that is used for experiments related to the immune system. Um, such as hypersensitivity to certain substances or erythema. And this can be done by exposing allergens to the surface of the HSE and then identifying the, the mechanisms. And it would be helpful in an HSE like this to also include immune, immune cell layers within, just as you saw, we saw in the original skin structure. 
and um, the lower right corner we see lightning and with an HSE made by mixing melanocytes with keratinocytes which often are at a great interplay um, you can perform a whitening test which basically tracks any changes in the amounts and forms of melanocytes in response to a substance over time. As you can see the, uh, the day 6 through day 14 um, chart below. The HSC also finds applications um, large, largely in the pharmaceutical industry from novel drug screening to drug delivery mechanisms. It is possible to judge the presence or absence of toxicity with the aid of phototoxic substances. And it is also possible check, to check the degree of aging of the skin by conducting a UV transmission test. An aging skin model also can be, can be made and it could be done by manipulating the dermis layer um, and choosing the cell types from different sources. And the effectiveness and toxicity of anti-aging related cosmetics may be evaluated. With the use of something called the comet assay, it is even possible to check the presence or absence of genetic toxicity by analyzing DNA damage in the HSC. And this would basically lead to um, testing the molecular mechanisms within the tissue that you have just created um, by tearing it apart and you know, analyzing it, just as you would do with skin biopsies. As such, there are numerous efficacy tests already with the HSE. And today, the range of applications is only growing, making it a versatile alternative to animal testing with the maturation of the technology and our understanding about it. Now, I'm going to go over a few publication, reviews of publications on HSE that have to do with the, the skin physiology and disease modeling. Um, as well as in vivo. Now, skin cancer is a common cancer worldwide, affecting certain continents more so than others, but it, is, it exists in a range of types, including basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. And we can imagine the HSE made from a mixture of cancer cells and skin cells could help to study cancer-related gene pathways and the expression profiles of tumor suppressor genes, genetic mutations, and anti-damage from tissues occurring from cancer. And one interesting um, study I've also come across is uh, people have tried to create a human skin equivalent where they, they know that cancer has a certain environment characteristic. For example, the increased amount of hyaluronic acid compared to normal cells. So then they would just create that environment, that microenvironment by putting in a great deal of hyaluronic acid into the sub layers of skin and make it a tumor like uh, uh, skin model. Now, on the right, you see, uh, you see figures from a wound healing assay using the HSE. The wound healing assay uh, is a representative disease model that basically involves creating a model of chronic skin wounds by, by, by shining a laser on an uninjured 3D skin model. Then after the injury has created a wound, over a period of time, you follow it. Um, for instance, like the 22 hour uh, after injury in the picture above, and we assess the wound closure process and mechanisms in response to certain topical agents or cellular, cellular therapies that you put on top of it. Or you could just study the natural process of wound closure as well um, by you know, having it as the control. It is also possible to study disease models such as psoriasis and atopy, um, which are representative autoimmune diseases. And these publications show that. Um, you can refer to these for more information. Um, immune disease models can be induced by introducing various combinations of cytokines. If you look on the left, uh, in the case of the psoriasis model, the research group basically shows that they have created human skin equivalents that mimic what we see when skin is 
when skin has defects of psoriasis. We observe an irregular epidermal structure with a thinner than normal area in the psoriasis model. And in the atopic model, on the other hand, we see a, a sponge-like base layer with a thinner than normal epidermal structure. And in these models where the expression of specific protein markers also they noted has been reduced, basically showing that they have created disease models that are unlike the, the uh, normal human skin. Various tests to assess pathological effects of drugs and even gene therapy could potentially be performed on these HSEs. The HSC also offers an attractive disease model um, um, in the end to allow you to perform molecular biological analysis or physiological analysis um, that is more clinically relevant than perhaps the traditional animal models. Other than disease models, depending on which cell types you use, the HSEs can further open research avenues in skin physiology. Um, and you know that the skin, there's human to human variations as well, right? So the biggest one of focus may be aging. And we all know that donor cells from infants versus teens to 60s will exhibit different epidermal structures. And on the left hand side, there's a publication on the study of aging, aged skin physiology. Um, and it shows basically that the skin structure and also its behavior to certain compounds differ across age groups. This implies that for truly accurate skin research, um, targeting a global population, global age population, there is a need for a model for each age group. You can also imagine creating models for hair regeneration using the HSE, which would be a great interest worldwide. A hair skin model would further expand our portfolio of tests to include tests for hair products and drugs related to the scalp, hair roots, and hair loss. And here in this publication, hair implantation was done in a epidermis and dermis full thickness skin model. Um, and they have basically shown that the hair continued to um, basically exist upon the, the successfully structured dermis in the HSE. But perhaps the most um, apparent characteristic of skin that we all see just by eye is the differences in color across racial groups. Um, but and many publications have actually shown that um, the skin colors of each race, yes, it depends largely on the melanin forms and the amount of pigments, but just beyond the color appearance, melanin production is known to interplay with other features of the skin. For example, some publication shown here have shown that the size of pore varies from race to race. And as can be seen by the score index here, it increases in the order of Asian, the Caucasian, Hispanic, to African Americans. And there's that, that rhythm of skin color changes there as well. And given that pores are the first entryway for topical agents or chemicals to the skin, this may be an important consideration in the building of an HSE. But beyond this example, figures in the slide uh, below, down below show that with differences in skin color, there are also differences in overall gene expression profiles. And you can imagine that with you know, single cell profiling that is uh, much growing today, um, these difference, differences can be spotted even more finely um, with different uh, different models of hu human skin, considering the, the racial differences. Studies have shown that there is a racial difference in the epidermal architecture itself, in particular the structure of the stratum cornea, which is the most important factor to the burial function. So these all these differences were exhibited in terms of the number of its layers, lipid amounts, and moisture contents. And why do I mention all of these? Ultimately, these results cannot be ignored when we are serious about seeking to develop drugs and cosmetics that work best for each group in the age of personalized therapy today. So in summary, what we have discussed so far, point out that there are several key criteria for an ideal human skin equivalent. First, it must be faithful to the stratification structure 
and the cellular crosstalk and ECM signaling we see in the skin. It also needs to have considerations of diverse cell types beyond keratinocytes and fibroblasts, uh, mono or dye cultures that we are familiar with um, and expanding that portfolio to immune cells and even bacteria. It needs to have consideration of human to human variations in skin physiology, which we have seen across age groups, racial groups, and those with or without hair. And last but not least, an HSE should be scientific, but it should also abide by the regulatory guidelines, which is a measure of standardization. And this is something that is big in 3D printing today as well, as we're moving into biomedicine. And these regulatory guidelines for the skin um, could, dip, could rely on the standards that we have for in vitro skin tests by the OECD, which I understand are actually constantly updated to abide by the state-of-the-art techniques that are developing in the world today. Now, to improve skin research on demand and maximize the benefits that the bioprinting brings to the table, Rocket Healthcare has developed um, a service called the Epitem. Um, the Epitem is a platform technology for improving the time and cost of human research using two types of products. One is the Epitem Bioprinted HSE, which is basically bioprinted finished skin tissue products that come in well formats, ready to be used, um, delivered. But even more exciting, we believe, is the Epitem Creator Kit, basically utilizing Rocket Healthcare's 42 and 46 doctor in vivos, we have created a package that consists of the bioprinter, bio inks, media, cells, and protocol that adhere to the OECD regulatory guidelines for in vitro tests. And these are the differences between 42 and 46. The major difference being the um, six print tests and the built-in cell incubator, which we are first to introduce to, um, to the bioprinting world um, as we see today. Now, here are some in-house data on Apitem, or the human skin equivalent that has been bioprinted with in vivo. Figure one shows the histological characterization of Apitem, the epidermis version. As we have seen before, Apitem shows all four distinct sublayers of the epidermis from the stratum bacilli to the cornea. This is an HNE picture taken at 18 days of reconstruction. So we know, okay, structurally it mimics uh, what we should see in the human skin. Figure two shows his immunohistochemistry results staining for especially cytokeratin 10 and P63. Um, to speak briefly, cytokeratins are keratin proteins found in the intercytoplasmic cytoskeleton of epithelial tissue. And so cytokeratin 10 is one marker for keratinized, keratinized stratified epithelium. P63 is another marker, basically of epidermal lineage commitment. Um, as I mentioned before, epidermis is a result of uh, keratinocyte basically differentiating to the terminal stage as it goes up. And the expression localization of these proteins show that um, the bioprinted skin is closely mimicking what we should see in the structure. Now, besides structural features, the epitome has been tested against the OECD guidelines to assess functionality. The burial function test was done to observe the in vitro skin response after a certain chemical of known response is applied. And as is the standard, it was exposed to 1% triton X100 over a period of 18 hours. Epitem's ET50 value, which is basically the time it takes for the cell numbers to decrease below 50%, it was between approximately three and six hours. So that corresponded to what we'd expect from human skin. The irritation test, um, which you see on the right, basically outlines a portfolio of irritants and non-irritants of known activity to the human skin. And this is according to OECD guidelines, something we would be familiar with when we are assessing commercial in vitro skin tests. According to the test with Epitem, we observed that non-irritation chemicals showed over 50% cell viability, whereas classified irritant chemicals showed less than 50%, demonstrating that Epitem's human skin-like Functional characterization could also be done. 
But beyond in vitro tests, the same bioprinter was used to create um, the same bioprint that was used to create the in vitro has also been used in clinical applications in the operating theater. And I'd like to share in my next uh, two minutes, I have um, some data from there. And this is again, an exa example of the in vivo applications of human skin equivalent or regenerative patch. At Rocket Healthcare, uh, our team is dedicated to creating breakthrough methods for wound healing, especially for chronic wounds like diabetic foot ulcers. So in India, which is the number one country um, hardest hit by the, uh, by the prevalence of diabetes, we had a clinical study of 20 patients, uh, 20 patients and also standards. And as demonstrated by these pictures and graphs of 20 patients has tested, 100% demonstrated epithelialization of wounds when um, treated with autologous solutions from the patient printed into a patch customized to each wound. And basically these are wounds that had remained open from six months to two years using traditional wound dressing materials, such as negative pressure wound therapies. So the time it took was on average four weeks. The highlight is that bioprinted patches using patient autologous solution is an on-demand way in the operating theater. And these are real needs and these are real solutions. So the world's first bioprinter to regenerate human skin um, as a desktop bioprinter format is empowering, uh, we believe, your skin research. Well, all throughout, we have been talking about skin. Really, the bioprinter is a platform technology with limitless applications in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. That, and that is the point that I would like to really home in at the end of our presentation. And if you know what cells and what bio inks you ultimately want and the design you want, the bioprinter is not a perfect, but it is a better platform technology for creating those possible. And of course, human tissues are far from just Lego blocks. Um, and there are still many challenges to address in ever fully recapitulating the human tissues, if at all they are possible. But the key thing we believe is the progress that is being made going from 2D to 3D, uh, random to 3D, more bio-architecturally bio complex, rather than comprising with less effective or market-friendly alternatives. And also there has been progress on the use of biomaterials, more mimicking the ECM itself rather than using single components. So um, having said all of these, with the greater use of the data-driven technology, um, we as Rocket, at Rocket Healthcare believe we could have a better understanding of the human body. And so with that, these are the take home messages from today's animal alternative solutions are toxicological research and clinical transplantation are real needs. Bioprinting offers several advantages over traditional methods in the fabrication of human skin tissues for the, um, for the concepts of automation um, architectural complexity and autologous. Human skin equivalents must have various considerations of diverse cell types, human to human variations and disease models. And finally, with all of these said, Rocket Healthcare offers on-demand skin tissue fabrication services with Epitem. And with contents like these, we are committed to supporting your research as well. So thank you so much, all of you for joining today. And at this time, please feel free to ask, ask any questions. And we have uh, Shia Park, a colleague of mine who is in here today with me. So we will help to address the questions. I could address one question that was asked um, actually in yesterday's session, which specifically asked about, um, yeah, I'll answer this, um, which specifically asked about you know, how has the bioprinter been used in chronic wound um, healing? And I showed one applic application actually at the very end. Um, but a unique thing about the bioprinter is that its strength not only come from, you know, trying to create a fully uh, differentiated tissue and implanting it, but it also has a strength of simply just evenly distributing 
cells and evenly distributing autologous solutions into a into a regenerative patch that is minimally manipulated. So you don't have to culture, but you can still apply it to the defect area, expecting regenerative results from these autologous solutions. So the bioprinter can really be thought of as, as more than just a tissue fabricator, but also a regenerative solution. Um, yeah, solution creator for, for autologous therapies. Um, so Sergi asked, what was the duration of the test of the 20 different toxic versus non-toxic compounds in the epitaph? And the, for this one, are you talking about the um, irritation tests? Yeah, so for the for the irritation test um, for toxic versus non-toxic compounds, there is a standard guideline for the hours, and I know it as up to four hours. So within four hours, you basically get a classification of, of skin tissue responding to non-irritants and skin tissue responding to irritants. And um, toxic, toxic versus irritant is different. So I would say uh, this is an irritation test, not a not necessarily toxic test, toxicity test. Ah, can the HSE be adopted for mucosal models, such as oral mucosa? I know this may not fit into typical skin tissue. Any thoughts? Um, actually, we have uh, the chief of scientific staff in the R&D, skin R&D, here with us, um, Dr. Ji Hee Kim. So maybe she could also address this question. Can the HSE be adopted for mucosal models such as oral mucosa? Uh, I have some experience to uh, differentiate from the older uh, cells to some not a skin but kinds of um, the missing chyme uh, strain. So it probably can be possible to make HSE from the that. But uh, our lab actually tried some of cell line already but uh, we didn't actually succeed to make it from older mucosa to skin. But there might be some possibility. Any other questions? We have about uh, two minutes left of the session. Please feel free to ask. But know that we can also accept questions over email, which I uh, mentioned at the very beginning. And also provided with this session so so how much time does it take to print a one centimeter by one centimeter uh, hse model 10, which would be 10 mil 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters um this would depend really on the and this is a common question we ask when it comes to 3d printing itself um, this will depend on the printing speed that you give to the printer but it, let's say you are using, you know, just by standard way of experiments, 10 by 10 millimeters HSE could be printed within about uh, within about 30 minutes, um, depending on the number of layers that you put. And additionally, actually, now I'm actually trying to uh, one of clinical trial for diabetes with ulcers. And I actually print kind of artificial dermal patch, but well, basically it is not really artificial one because we actually use autologous cells. So uh, basically I print 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter as maximum for one time print with the doctor in vivo. And it only take, of course, the depth is not that uh, deep. It's only five millimeter and it takes only like uh, 10 to 15 minutes maximum. What was the largest size HSE 3D printed in the context of the printed files? Well, let me let me answer it. So, well, actually it depends on the size of the insert because we actually put the insert for the, uh, uh, the epidermis model. But uh, that's why we only try it till six well, um, culture this size. But if we use doctor in vivo, it doesn't matter with uh, uh, insert size or not, right? So, well, if you can design, you can actually fit maximized size of the artificial skin model. For example, 
Dr. In vivo could possibly fit at one time 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. That's why I also try to uh, treat the diabetic fluorosis or patient with that kind of uh, larger size. So while I would like to answer, you can actually print 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. But I understood that most of uh, researchers who use artificial skin model for toxicological tests they don't really uh, necessarily print that big artificial skin model because of the amount of cells. Thank you. Um, with the time having passed one hour, we will now um, end the session uh, as promised for the one hour. Please feel free to ask us any questions, leave us comments in the email uh, following the session and please keep uh, yeah, keep us keep following us in our Facebook, live, LinkedIn, or YouTube for more information on future webinars. Thank you so much, and have a good evening, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye.